Commissioner Robert Peck, the Commissioner of Public Buildings Services or for the General Service Administration, Dr. Catherine Anthony, Professor of Architecture at the University of Illinois, and Sharon Pratt Dixon, former mayor of Washington, D.C. Boy. It is a long-standing policy, before you sit down, uh, it's a long-standing policy that we swear all of our witnesses in. So if you'd be kind enough to raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Let the record reflect that the answer in the affirmative may be seated. Let me begin by asking all witnesses to summarize their testimony in five minutes. Uh, of course, the yellow light means you have a minute left, and the red light all over America means stop. And then, of course, we will have time to ask questions, you know, of course, which is very important. So why don't I begin with you, um, Commissioner Peck. Uh, please present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I note the presence previously of Ranking Member Mr. Issa and uh, other members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to appear before you today to discuss H.R. 4869, the Restroom Gender Parity and Federal Buildings Act. Uh, our administrator, Martha Johnson, you may suspect from her name, is interested in this too. GSA supports restroom gender parity. We strive to provide welcoming, easily accessible, and comfortable facilities and equally accessible restrooms for our federal workforce and visitors. GSA's current standards achieve parity in most instances in buildings that we are now building and renovating, and they exceed, in fact, private building code standards. In the few instances in which our current standards do not meet parity, GSA is revising our standards to ensure that the goal is achieved. We own more than 1,500 federal buildings on behalf of the American people, and we provide space to more than one million federal employees. As you are aware in this committee, I believe, GSA has an aging portfolio of buildings. The average age of a GSA government building is 46 years. We have over 500 buildings that were built before 1950 during a time in which there were fewer women in the workforce, or at least the perception that there were fewer women in the workforce. As a result, most of our older buildings do not meet parity in restrooms, but as we modernize and as we construct new buildings, we improve our facilities to meet the goal of parity. We publish a facility standards document that establishes design standards and criteria for new construction and major alterations in GSA buildings, largely derived from industry standards, including the International Code Council standards. Our standards exceed industry building codes and generally meet restroom parity. In other words, we provide more restrooms for both men and women than the private codes generally require. Since the early 1980s, our standards have prescribed the number of toilets required in men's and women's restrooms. And as in most instances, the number of toilets in women's restrooms equals the combined number of toilets and urinals in men's restrooms. In assembly areas, such as training and conference facilities in our buildings, we require more toilets in women's restrooms than in men's restrooms, and in fact, a ratio of three to two. There are, however, in our current standards, in three tiers out of eight, and the tiers are tiers in which we, uh, we consider the number of people per restroom, three tiers out of eight in which our facility standards, although again higher than, than the building code requires, where we do not meet restroom parity. Uh, we are revising our standards to ensure gender parity in all circumstances. We are issuing a new facility standards document, and it will require parity across all of the tiers, and I would note that uh, the, those three of the eight tiers, we are off by one, that there are uh, three occasions on larger numbers of people per floor in which we, our current standards would allow more men's facilities than women's. Uh, I should also note we've recently surveyed our buildings, and it appears that in almost all of the new courthouses and other buildings we've been building over the last 15 years, we've met the parity standard. 
As we continue to modernize older buildings in our inventory, we will, we will meet these parity requirements. In addition to federally owned buildings, and your legislation contemplates this, we also uh, lease a lot of facilities for the federal government. And uh, the GSA standard leasing uh, solicitation for offers, an SFO, requires lessors to provide toilet fixtures, and it currently says, based on the ratio of men and women that will occupy the lease space. Uh, I think that's a standard. It's hard to contemplate, hard to predict, and we are going to change our standard to require that restroom parity uh, be available in every leased facility where we can find it. I just have to note that there are occasions in which we lease facilities in very uh, in rural or very small areas in which uh, small towns in which we don't have a lot of competition, and it may be may not be possible to find a leased facility that has parity, but. Uh, we, those will be waiver instances, and otherwise we're going to require it. As I mentioned, we support improving the quality and equality in restrooms uh, wherever possible. We are going to address this issue as we undertake future construction, modernization, and leasing actions. We fully support the intention of this bill, and as I say, we are moving today to make sure that in those few instances where we don't currently meet the standards, that we will. I want to thank you for inviting me to testify today. And of course, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. One other note is I would like to, uh, we will submit our current facility standards for your record so that you can see them. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner uh, Peck. Uh, now I'd like to call on um, Dr. Catherine Anthony, the Professor of Architecture at the University of Illinois. Okay. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, members of the committee, thank you so much for the invitation to appear before you today. It's an honor and one of the highlights of my professional career. I'm the only female full professor in the School of Architecture at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where I've taught for 26 years. I've published widely on gender issues in design. I applaud the committee for an addressing an issue near and dear to my heart and near and dear to the hearts and bladders of women and children all across the United States, one that is long overdue. Ever since California led the way, by passing the nation's first potty parity legislation, many states and municipalities across the country have passed similar laws and ordinances to provide equal speed of access for women and men to public restrooms. Yet today marks a milestone. It's the first time that this issue is addressed at the federal level. Congratulations. I stand here today on behalf of your mothers, grandmothers, daughters, granddaughters, sisters, aunts, nieces, and countless female friends. No matter what our race, color, creed, age, size, shape, or political party, Democrat, Republican, Independent, or Green, we all share one frustrating experience. All too often, we watch our male counterparts zip in and out of the restroom in a flash, while at the ladies' room, we're stuck waiting in long lines. And the men in our life have been stuck waiting for us. Why? Much of our built environment, including that owned by the federal government, was constructed in a different era, one where women were not as prevalent in the public realm and in the workforce as we are today. Until recently, most architects, contractors, engineers, building code officials, and clients were not concerned about this issue. They rarely contacted women about their restroom needs. Women were rarely employed in these male-dominated professions, nor were they in a position to affect change. But finally, now we are. Why is this important? The average person uses a toilet about six to eight times a day, as many as 2,920 times per year. By age 80, we will have taken over 200,000 trips to the toilet and spent two years of our life in restrooms. No matter what our stature in life, whether we're the President of the United States, the First Lady, or the homeless person on the street, we all use them. We may laugh and we may joke, but for millions of people around the world, boys and girls, men and women of all ages, especially pregnant and menstruating women, using the restroom is no laughing matter. Emergencies happen, accidents happen, urinary tract infections happen, delaying voiding can result in serious medical conditions, unsanitary, unsafe restrooms in our nation's schools force thousands of children to wait to use their bathroom at home, and holding it in can take its toll. Forcing half the population to wait in line for restrooms is a subtle yet powerful form of gender discrimination. Public restrooms are just one of many instances where women and girls are disadvantaged by design, a topic I'm writing about in my new book. Even in the U.S. Capitol, until recently, Congress women and women senators were forced to use restrooms far away from the House and Senate floors, causing some to miss important votes. 
Public restrooms are a fundamental part of our nation's infrastructure, just as important as our roads and bridges. Taking care of our bodies is just as important as taking care of our cars. Public restrooms are a health and safety issue. In this respect, we lag far behind countries like Japan, where clean, safe, available restrooms are integral parts of the urban landscape. If it were up to me, constructing cutting-edge, well-designed, safe, 21st century public restrooms should be part of another national stimulus package. They make downtowns more user-friendly, they encourage walking, and help combat obesity. It would be money well spent. In an ideal world, I would call for even greater numbers of women's to men's fixtures, as is already the case in many states and municipalities with ratios of 2 to 1, 3 to 1, or even 4 to 1. Such ratios are most needed when large groups of people amass all at once, such as when a court session adjourns or when a group of school children visit. In an ideal world, I would call to, for mandatory retrofits to all existing buildings, not just renovation and new construction. Just as millions of persons with disabilities benefit every day from the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, millions of women and children would benefit every day from even greater potty parity laws. But as a realist, I believe that this act paves the way for future changes that could have just as sweeping impacts as the ADA. It's now time for the federal government to act. Today's proposed legislation is a small but significant step in the right direction, an achievement worth celebrating, one that you can all be proud of. It will have a positive impact on women and children across the USA and on the men who wait for them. That's one small step for Congress, one giant leap for humankind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anthony, for that very powerful statement. Um, now we will have uh, Sharon Pratt, the former mayor of Washington, D.C., and the only woman ever to be mayor of Washington, D.C., Ms. Pratt. Yeah, hopefully that will change. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of H.R. Uh, 4869, the Restroom Gender Parity and Federal Buildings Act. I believe an overwhelming number of Americans, especially women and girls, support the principles and purpose of this legislation. However, some may be hesitant about coming forward to support this legislation because it's so easy to make light of this effort and to mock those advancing this cause. As such, I truly appreciate the leadership you have provided, Chairman Towns, Congressman Issa, Congresswoman Clark, Congressman Visklosky have provided in this matter. I am a native Washingtonian, as is my distinguished representative, Eleanor Holmes Norton. And except for three years in New York City, I have lived here all my life. Not surprisingly, I have regularly patronized federal buildings for meetings, major events, and recreation. And I can speak from personal observation and experience. As a woman resident, as the former mayor of this city, as a mother of two daughters, as a grandmother now of a granddaughter, with regards to the disparity in restrooms, you can characterize it as follows. It is glaring, it is inconvenient, it is enormously inefficient, and it's downright unfair. Indeed, given the logistics associated with the restroom ritual, true parity would probably require two to one ratio of toilets for women to men. Nonetheless, I am pleased to support and endorse in my way legislation that at least ensures some level of parity in this matter. Our society has come a great distance in my lifetime. We certainly are a society today that now genuinely supports equal rights for women. However, if the practical reality is a woman will be late for a meeting, miss much of a concert, because there are built-in impediments to equally navigating the world at large, stemming from an absence of parity in restrooms, women are still not equal. Mr. Chairman and members of this committee, I heartily applaud you for your leadership on H.R. 4869. Thank you so much for your testimony. Let me thank all three of you for your testimony, and I think you've been very, very helpful. And let me just sort of ask um, a couple of questions. First, um, um, uh, Dr. Anthony, how can we get people 
to take this more seriously? Yeah, I th that's an excellent question. And so many people joke about this subject, but when it affects you personally, it's not funny. <laughs> Uh, how we can get people to take it more seriously is there's a lot of people out there with invisible issues uh, that really desperately need bathrooms right away, but we don't know who they are. They know who they are. We probably all know people who have these situations, but they may not all make them apparent to us. Uh, combat war veterans, people who've been injured, uh, may have serious uh, situations with uh, bladder control, uh, older men with prostate problems, also an issue, anybody who's experienced that, uh, imagine what it would feel like if you needed to relieve yourself and you couldn't find an open stall right away. That's what it feels like for women on a regular basis and for children on a regular basis. Um, there's a lot of people who have reasons why they would need to use a restroom right away. Ulcerative colitis, other kinds of issues, people have to change ostomy bags. A lot of people out there who really, really need better restrooms. So it's a, a health and safety and a medical issue. Um, Ms. Pratt, let me ask you, um, being the former executive of a city that has a tremendous amount of federal buildings, do you think that if we would improve this situation that it might even assist us economically? Well, it, I would have to encourage, it would have to be a plus in terms of encouraging uh, use of federal buildings. Uh, because to me, the overarching issue is just how illogical it is, how, you know, obviously inefficient and illogical it is, and you're discouraging at least a half, if not more often, of the population from using your facilities. So I think uh, it could only be a plus in terms of encouraging use of our federal buildings. Yeah, let me um, ask you, Commissioner, you know, I know you have a lot of issues over at GSA, how important is this issue uh, at GSA? Well, uh, I'll, does it have uh, a priority? Well, let, let me let me answer two ways. It is, um, uh, it's a, it, it's clearly an issue that's uh, over the years has been enough of an issue that we have changed our standards and brought it and brought our standards up to one of parity. Uh, I I do want to say it's not an issue I'd given a lot of thought to till you uh, scheduled the hearing and. Um, I, I think that's a I think that's quite useful uh, in in the kinds of buildings that we at GSA run and I want to United States of America Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton uh, thank you very much Mr. Chairman and whose subcommittee has primary jurisdiction over GSA uh, as well now to follow up on the um, the, um, the question of the ranking member uh, this uh, statutory law at the moment says what, uh, Mr. Peck? You, you know, we we have not found a uh, we've not found a statutory. So there is no part. statute governing as this near, matter. As near as we can tell, now, we have there are OSHA regs for private sector, and we have our own code. So as I understand the um, the the. Um, statute, uh, the bill before us, it says equals or exceeds. Uh, the, this is obviously a statute, uh, a bill aimed to make sure that women are not put in an unequal position. Um, this, the, the ranking member is correct. You may have a building which has more men than women who are employed in the building. I'm not sure what that tells us. Uh, necessarily about the number of visitors to the building. It may or may not tell us something. Uh, would, uh, in light of the fact that the bill says equals or exceeds, uh, do you believe that you would have sufficient uh, discretion uh, to deal with buildings which may, in fact, have uh, different genders that come at different times? And remember, <laughs> who used to come here once and who comes here now. Uh, remember that in the, the House of Representatives, we have very few women now, and yet there is parity, uh, as the ranking member said, here in the Rayburn, and I think in most of the uh, buildings. Um, would this law uh, keep you from exercising the appropriate flexibility uh, as it now stands? the language? Um, 
As regards GSA, I don't believe so. I believe it. I believe it could work. There is a provision in the legislation that says that the Administrator of General Services uh, can issue a statement if the if the parity is is unachievable or not or not feasible. And I think we would want that that kind of dis discretion. Mm -hmm. I, I would note. I mean, there are, and you, you've alluded to it. At one time, we would have built a land port of entry, a border station, with hardly any facilities for women, at least among the patrol force, because customs didn't have very many women agents, and now they do. And we wouldn't want to. We we don't want to uh, factor into our planning the way the workforce looks now, because it will. We think it will change and evolve, which makes it a little more complicated. But anyway, I think that the legislation gives us some discretion that that's important. I, I regret that we, that we we have to do a bill at all. I, this is the kind of matter that I think should be done administratively. We are forced to do a bill because of what what the, what the uh, experience uh, does show, Mr. Peck. Um, as you know, I'm also on the Homeland Security Committee, and I have a beef with um, with the way in which we secure buildings uh, that is relevant, I think, to this hearing. Um, I'm going to give you an example of what I mean. We're talking about people visiting buildings, but um, I, I, we, you and I know of, of, of a building, a very new building, to which the public doesn't have access at all whether they have to go to the laboratory or not. I refer to the brand new Department of Transportation building along M Street. Bad enough that the security involves uh, a federal employee having to come down to get even a staff member from the House of Representatives uh, for admission to that building. But what I think is far worse, uh, and I I pick M Street for a reason. M Street is just being built up. We have our Southeast Federal Center bill. We're so pleased with the uh, progress you're making on, on that um, construction. Uh, but imagine a woman or parent who finds herself down there on M Street and they say, oh, there's a federal building. At last we have a place we can go to use the laboratory, Johnny. But she gets to the door of the Department of Transportation. And even though there's a magnometer there to protect the public and the building, she, she is not admitted to the building to use the restroom, to use the cafeteria paid for by public funds. How can you justify closing off laboratories to people outside of the building? who have every reason to believe that a building paid by taxpayers is one that should admit them given the proper magnetometers and, sec and security and perhaps even showing uh, some identification. Uh, Ms. Norton, you, uh, as you know from our previous conversations, I, I share your concern about the, um, the lack of consistency in, in building access into buildings in Washington, D.C. Uh, I have been having conversations with the Federal Protective Service, which has a role in this, with the uh, Interagency Committee on uh, Security, uh, which uh, has some control over this, and with some of the agencies, including the Department of Transportation, uh, that, that have these rules. I can only tell you that um, so far I've had only limited success.